here at Code Spike the first time. Welcome. So uh, we do events like this uh, about eight times a month right now. Uh, different topics, uh, different styles. We have uh, build nights on the last Monday of every month where we get together and we get some food and share what projects we're working on and work on them together. Um, we do lectures like this. We run. Uh, we help support the Python groups lectures, and there's some reading groups that meet here in uh, machine learning group, the data out, data structures and algorithms group, um, and there's also a Haskell reading group that's still going on through Go Spy. So uh, we support a lot of different kind of uh, events, all focused on making people better software developers. And I'm glad you're here. Well, software developers and software professionals. I'm glad you're all here to even better software professionals. Uh, Chris is going to give us an introduction to Kubernetes. And once I dim light, he's ready to go. So. Intro to. I have to start the live stream. Tonight's event will be live streamed. Uh, so you can also go back and share the video if you like Chris's talk. You have your friends. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, this is an introduction to Kubernetes. Um, a lot of this talk is really, um, sorry, where this first? The who and the why of Kubernetes. There's a lot of talks on intro to Kubernetes, intro to Dr. Swarm, <laughs> but there's very few talks on like, why would I want to use this thing in the first place? So the first stage is I'm going to tell a few stories that you may be familiar with. I know I am familiar with them because I've done all of them. Uh, but I thought it was very important to have some like funny little stories about why it makes sense to use Kubernetes when you're deploying really large scale applications. So this will be about me. Uh, I'm an advisory software engineer at IBM. Um, title really doesn't mean anything, um, but that's what it is. Uh, I'm part of the open source technology team, uh, which is under the IBM Digital Business Group, which is right beside like IBM Cloud. Um, I work on Kubernetes and other CNCF projects full time. And if you're going to be tweeting at the event, make sure you do CN Luciano with an underscore. CN Luciano without the underscore is a lot more successful from, uh, than I am. <laughs> we found it some sort of like junk removal thing like you see in hoarders. <laughs> he doesn't need the extra PR, but I do. So, um, Essentially what I do day to day is other people from IBM that have requirements on Kubernetes, they're building on top of it, they're users, they bring those requirements to me, and depending on if I work on that area of Kubernetes, I'm the one that um, gets the, either the changes that they made open source or revise it, proposals. Um, a lot of times, uh, some of the individuals just don't have the time to really sit and work with the community to get things upstream, so that's what I recommend. Um, the CNCF projects, there's quite a load of them. The only other one that I really worked on is Prometheus, which I hope to have talks on in the future. So just a brief overview, the who, the who and why, um, the architecture, very basic architecture overview. Some of the concepts that you'll hear a lot when talking in the context of Kubernetes, and then demoing the concepts, and then uh, just a brief pitch for how can I not have to worry about any of this and just use Kubernetes. So traditionally, uh, when uh, we have an application and we build our application, uh, represented by my application, and then we place it into a gray box of some sort. And the box is either a VM or a bare metal, and you could even have these in containers. Um, however, uh, the, the, the specific application that we're deploying isn't really uh, dependent on the specific runtime. It just needs to you know, gather dependencies. It needs uh, to mention how it needs to be run, and also maybe a few parameters to make sure it doesn't go outside of bounds. Um, in order to deploy these applications, you know, you create our super, uh, super bash script deluxe.sh. Um, when we get to the point where we have a newer version, we use upgrade to the max.sh to place some things on here. 
if we're getting a little more advanced with uh, current number applications, you know, we rather than Python, <laughs> so, which makes it better. <laughs> uh, when, we, when we start to uh, get even more advanced on that, we figure out that you know someone's already probably written some of this stuff with configuration management, or uh, maybe they have uh, their own test suites, and it becomes sufficiently complex that we decide we need some tests. So better upgrade it in Python and now gets tests, and then we find a framework to do it and place it in the framework. In the end, we end up stacking up layers and layers just to deploy our application and build it and just pull in some dependencies. Um, in the end, all we have it, when we do is take an artifact and place it somewhere and have it run in a, kind of a uniform way, a way that's expected. So I ended up with um, of, uh, stacks on stacks on stacks. And I actually took this picture thanks to Justin. He had some like Monopoly money and some <laughs> So then uh, the next thing we want to do is we want to, have, we want to run our application. So you start it up.sh, that's my dog waking up in the morning, um, representing your application. And uh, running an application in production isn't always easy. You know? um, Post installation, you know, we really need to babysit our application and make sure that it's running to the capacity levels that we would like it at. Uh, so what we do is we layer on more tooling to kind of scrape endpoints. Um, if you use an uptime type of service that scrapes the endpoints and then redirects that to some other service to tell you if it's down. Um, we also use uh, you know, things like Grafana in order to calculate the, our metrics. You know, there's like something like this is a working production graph. And we have some percentage of uptime over here which correlates to time. <laughs> so it's time it's uh, working versus not working, and the graph that helped one time, but probably just needs to be improved. Yeah. So all these things try to give us a little bit more uh, meaning behind uh, problems when they arise. Uh, so when something does happen, uh, a human goes to is it working production graph, grafana.com, looks at their picture, and then maybe starts using some uh, super special Python tools that they wrote, because you know, they graduated from Bash, in order to detect and reason about what actually is going wrong with the application. Um, in the end, um, they might end up finding a problem that corresponds to the runbook, and the runbook tells them to run checkmetric.sh, see if the checkmetric.sh returns anything, and then they just end up rebooting the server anyway. Now, if it's Wednesday and snowing, they need to be directed to another run book, <coughs> number 16, step one, only to reboot the server again, potentially. Yeah. <laughs> so things like this can really be codified in such a manner um, that it would not require someone to get paid at night. Because most of these things, uh, your uptime checker and whatnot, get fed into a bin that ends up waking someone up at night just to reboot the server. Not saying reboot the server is also is always the best thing, but the analogy I had uh, with, for this was um, if you have like a I'm open or a daily menu sign outside of your restaurant and there's a breezy day, it keeps on just uh, busting over your sign. Someone comes up, picks it up, and then you return to step one. Uh, my application is just a daily menu sign on a breezy day. It's falling over and picking it up. Scaling an application, uh, we're doing well. We have great success. You know, uh, we told our manager our numbers. We have great success. We're now uh, importing our handcrafted made in Madagascar organic gavel juice. We're doing very well, uh, but we've gotten to the point where we really need to scale out our application. You know, whereby we once had one, now we need six of these random boxes. More traffic, more power. So we uh, log into our machines. You know, we start. Uh, figuring out which applications um, need to be scaled up. We go into our load balancer, we add in those new applications, make sure that they're actually part of the cluster, and then we uh, move on. You know, we continue buying our uh, organic apple juice until we get to the point where now we have less traffic. So where before we had six, we need to go back to one because uh, we have a problem of, I need to balance my organic orange juice consumption and have it not be affected by rise and fall in traffic to my service. So we go in, we try to figure out uh, which services um, are not currently handling connections. 
know, and then we uh, use our Chisel and Bash scripts to figure that out. And um, we need to be certain that whatever ones we drop off don't currently have connections. And if we drop off some of the ones that currently do have connections, then those users kind of get a bad experience. Similar is upgrading an application. I have a blog page. I have hilarious video number one. Dave from Accounting uses my service to share my newest uh, videos with his office mates. Um, when I go to app upgrade my application, I have a new video. It's going to be hilarious video number two. So I'm going to display, uh, because I'm using a canary mechanism, I'm only going to deploy this to five of my 20 machines. So I start deploying app hilarious video number two. I place it on several machines. I'm looking at my metrics. Um, but oh no, I accidentally plugged in hilarious video number three. The world's not ready for hilarious video number three. <laughs> Date from accounting it is showing three different versions. So I have to do something similar to a scaling application. I have to figure out which ones are, are wrong, but maybe some of these did get to, but someone pushed video number three because I was using latest in my Docker image. So I accidentally got hilarious video number three. So we go back to the process of checking each individual thing, figuring out where the connections are, draining them, removing the middle balancer, and all of that. Uh, and then next time, maybe we add another graph on here for uh, this working production graph that'll help for that one time that we figure this out. The problem, I have a lot of avocados here, but I only want the ones that will yield guacamole now. So I need a way to figure out well, which of these applications uh, explicitly need to be upgraded. I need a way to canary these applications in a reasonable manner so that I'm not either throwing uh, using all the avocados or selecting ones only to figure out they were bad in the end. Last thing, scheduling an application. So one application to rule them all. So I had one, I now want to take this application. You know, I've gotten very good at Tetris over the years, so I figured out that based on some resource uh, consumption requirements of your Java heap and what you're gonna start with, I think that I can reasonably balance these out onto these nodes to make them fit. Because uh, I wanna continue to uh, buy that lunch juice, so I need to make sure that I'm saving money and not wasting any space. But as we know, uh, applications aren't very uniform. You know, sometimes we have big smiley faces and stars and triangles. So these uh, overlap over each other in, in quite different ways. And if I come along and have a new application that I have nothing about, what happens if I set the wrong requirements and uh, the application just ends up ooming? It'd be great to be at a point where I could have a reasonable time uh, start with uh, what I think it's going to be most of the time, but then have the max constraints. So there's a little bit more of a, a leeway for my application, have a sync process or something that runs every so often, but then we'll give that memory back to others that might want to use it in the end. <coughs> Scheduling application also, you know, you can figure out where things are fitting into your is it working production graph. So the problem I need to make sure that I can rearrange cars efficiently. When that large SUV comes in and needs to get to the Penguins game, I need to make sure that I can reshuffle my applications appropriately in order to both satisfy uh, me making more money, but also saving space for the big applications that come along that might not play into the way that I'm used to uh, moving my cars around. So I have kind of a summary of the problems here. We want capacity management during peak times. Scheduling for unpredictability in our application. Reliable upgrades. You know, I want to make sure that if I upgraded um, on two of the machines, I'm getting the exact same three things on the other, app, uh, the other machines. I want to make sure that I deploy the same way every time. And machines uh, can monitor and fix themselves, so I'm going to let them do that without building the necessary tooling myself. So, this is where Kubernetes comes in. Now, Kubernetes is uh, very different from some of the other systems you might be used to, like Mesos and Swarm. There's a lot more components that all handle a very specific thing. It's designed kind of like in a microservice-y fashion. Uh, however, some things have kind of started to get mono repo -y. However, um, the Kubernetes master components are divided into these four. So etcd is your backend data store for Kubernetes. Any information about updates or creations, anything that happens in the cluster, everything gets stored in etcd to be referenced later so that you can have the master on a 
another machine and then have it fail over the other machines, bring new ones up. It's just gonna, everything's gonna call XCP. Uh, then you have the Kube API server, which is kind of self-explanatory. It's just, it serves all of the API requests for clients, whether that be you on your local laptop or if you're building a more sophisticated application, you can use the API server directly. There's a controller manager, which kind of just runs uh, routine tasks. You can build your own controllers to kind of reconcile important things that you'd like to do in your cluster on a day-to-day -day or periodic basis. So there's one kind of <coughs> controller manager that will them all, but there are different ones in there for running daily to uh, remove some temporary files or anything that isn't being used by active pods anymore. The last one is the scheduler, which is the thing that actually looks for new things that need to be created that don't currently have a node assigned. So it's pulling from the Kube API server, you've created a pod, it's sitting there, it's not scheduled, the scheduler notices that, and it uses predetermined um, priorities and predicates to figure out where this can land and in what order it should land to make sure that balancing everything happens automatically. So these are kind of the, like the master process. <coughs> then you have the node sort of process. Um, on your worker nodes, you have the kubelet. The kubelet collects a lot of resources about the node and exposes all those resources up so that the scheduler knows on what machines can I store um, or can I load uh, GPU-based targets? What machines have this amount of CPU um, also mixed with this amount of memory. So it's taking care of figuring out uh, what I currently have running. Uh, it manages the entire life cycle of the things that you schedule to it, and it basically takes care of doing all the work. The master node is really just about getting it to the kubelet. Um, there's the kube proxy, which um, Kubernetes has a very advanced networking model, and it sets a lot of these things up by creating a lot of IP tables rules. So. When you create a new service of sorts, it's going to start injecting in IP tables rules depending on how it's set up. Out of the box, it's using IP tables rules normally. And then it's also taking care of forwarding those to the direct node. So if a request comes to a node where there isn't that current service that you're requesting, it's going to use IP tables to figure out, okay, where does it need to send it on to? You have your container runtime. Um, at the moment, the biggest kind of container runtime is your Rocket and Docker. In the latest version of Kubernetes, um, they enabled something that more generically represents uh, runtime components so that you can swap these in easier. Um, it allows you to choose whichever runtime you think works best for your use case. Last one is kind of the supervisor D. It's basically like the upstart or the system D that babysits the kubelet itself. Um, there's one final one in here that I didn't uh, mention, but because of the uh, advanced uh, nature of the networking components and also the ability to plug into that, um, there's such thing called a, a CNI plugin. Um, so some of these are uh, Calico, uh, Weave, Flannel. These are things that actually the Kubernetes kubelet hands off to these sort of plugins in order to create customized networking rules and things like that. Um, if you do not install a CNI plugin on a node, it'll default to host-based Docker networking, which is kind of you needing to open up the ports yourself, making sure to assign uh, what your uh, Docker IP or what your Docker application is trying to expose, and then also what you want people to connect to it on. So. You really only gain all of the nice ease out of Kube Proxy if you're installing a CNI plugin. Um, and those, like I said, numer as much as container runtimes. So core concepts. What are the basic building blocks of Kubernetes? So here I kind of have like the uh, Maslow hierarchy of needs in the Kubernetes sense here. We start at the bottom with containers. The container's your basic building block. This is your Docker image, your <coughs> image. Maybe just a, a dev file of some sort so that your scheduler knows how to install on here. But all of this is being combined up into something that's either one process or one application. Um, other schedulers, uh, aside from Kubernetes, um, kind of play off of using VMs where containers in the way that you would use VMs. Just shove whatever you want into that container, the same thing you would do with a VM and have at it. Um, 
I created, a, I have a talk submitted for uh, another conference where I'm going to talk about why that's a bad idea. But in essence, you start to lose a lot of the practicality of Docker VMs when you start shipping multiple processes in a VM. And also makes it that much harder to figure out what went wrong in the end if one of those dependent processes go down. Because if one of those goes down, uh, your health check might depend on it, and you have no idea which one actually went down. So you have to have sufficiently more complex monitoring tools to figure out and detect things that run within a, a Docker container if it doesn't correlate to just one service. I had trouble with the screen that like escaping, just kind of beach balls for a bit. So as an example of some of these concepts, let me uh, make this bigger. That's too many. Everybody read this in the back? Yeah. No. Bob Mauer? Uh, bigger, bigger, bigger. <coughs> Have a plus to me. Have a plus. Turn on the voiceover. There it is. Yeah. Yeah. That's better. Especially the board I've recently so my uh, uh, indentation is a little different. Yeah. So here's a basic spec of what, of what I'm going to be um, deploying to Kubernetes. Um, but since we only talked about containers, let's just talk about the containers. So with inside the spec, I have my containers. I name it whatever I want it to be called later on. Um, you can reference things uh, from other things by name or by labels that you attach to the specific things you're deploying. Image is what I'm referencing as my Docker image. Uh, this is a Prometheus application. It's not really important what it does. It's just an example. And then the ports that I'm opening up right here uh, are dependent on the container port. So I'm saying, the application that runs within this container listens on 9090. So that's what I'm opening up with container port. Lots of some of the more advanced things you can do is you can start creating um, persistent volumes for these things. So say I have an external cluster or an external uh, like NetApp, and this is where I'm storing my data. I can plug that into Kubernetes to have it manage and auto-attach some of these things to my applications. So that's why I demonstrated here with volume mounts. There's a huge list of things that you can shove into a pod spec here. Um, and uh, for that, I'll just default to the documentation because it doesn't make sense for me to explain all of them. Um, but uh, when I want to create a second container, I can do that right here. I specify that I'm using Grafana with this. It listens on 3000. And these are the volume mounts I specifically want for it. So pod is a collection of containers. Um, this is where you kind of move up one more level. Um, why would you want a pod is, is a very good first question. And a pod grants you uh, specific things uh, that you would kind of have to wire together yourself, either with some external resource or a discovery uh, management application or um, just hard coding it directly. So things launched within a pod, which is represented by multiple containers, could just be one container. But in the end, it's always going to create a pod. Um, they could talk to each other over local host. Um, that doesn't mean that you can expose the same port and as well figure out that one rules over the other. Because of local host, it needs to be on separate ports. So if you said 8080 for your web application, and you also want to uh, have another web application that's exposed in there, um, that needs to not be 9090 or something else. It's important to note that pods are always scheduled as a group. They're both co-located and co-scheduled. So in order for a pod deployment to be successful, all of the containers within it have to be up and responding to their health checks. And they're also all scheduled on the same node. That's what allows you to talk over local host and doesn't require some of the advanced networking. So a pod is, is kind of a rep, oops. It's harder to like make sure you can see on the back and like have it all together, but the spec part that you're entering in is the pods in this example, it's right here. So like I said before, pods can be represented by multiple containers, which is what we have right here. Um, 
nothing too special as far as like extra options to place something for the pod, because in the end it's always going to launch a pod no matter if you have one container or five. That is within this one. If you have put a second one in here, it's going to be called something different. That'll be a different container. Um, so pods by themselves, unfortunately, don't really give you a lot of the HA type of uh, features that you would come to think of uh, with your load balancer or anything. And how do you say that I want a lot of these pods put together such that I can start to build up different services? This is where you run the replication set. And the replication set is basically babysitting your pods to make sure that if you said you have five, it's gonna keep submitting requests to make sure that the scheduler created five. Uh, if you say that you now want three, it's going to remove some of those and uh, make sure that you forevermore have three until you change it. Um, unfortunately, uh, Kubernetes changes quite frequently, and there's some uh, components in here where replicas, you might see something called replica controllers. Uh, it's basically just the old term that they used to do it. I don't know why replica sets sounded better. It just did. So a lot of times when uh, you're looking through the documentation, you'll see replica set and replica controller um, interchangeable. And at the end, they also added something called a deployment which is what I have in my example here, um, which basically just wraps up a replica set and pods and everything into one kind of package. So this whole thing represents a deployment, as you see right here with the kind deployments. Um, if I'm just deploying a replica set as not part of the deployment, the kind's gonna be different. It's gonna be replica set and everything. Uh, to define replica sets, that's right here, uh, replicas. And then you can also, in addition to attaching labels to individual containers, you can attach labels to individual um, replica sets. And this will prove to be important in the next slide. So now that you've uh, deployed your, your two replica sets, you have a front end, you have a back end replica set. You have uh, as many of those as you want. Now you start to combine things into higher levels called a service. Um, the docs on services, unfortunately, are kind of confusing too because the service is a ge very generic um, way of representing how you want these things to communicate. Depending on if um, a certain cloud that you're using exposes it, you could end up with a load balancer as a service. So the load balancer looks at labels that you've placed on your replica set and combines those together. IP tables rules are changed. You end up with an IP in the end called a cluster IP that you can use to uh, represent basically your entire service. So now you don't have to query your discovery application in order to find every single instance of this and then pick out which you think is the best one. Uh, the services will take care of removing and adding and uh, make sure the replica sets of course are uh, doing their due diligence as far as bringing up the numbers that you want. So normally you'll have you know, your replica set for your front ends and your back ends. A service is really all about those labels that you attach to them, because when you define a service, you need to make sure to specify what things are part of the service, and you do that with labels. Okay, demo time. So um, for the purpose of this, I didn't want to spin up kind of like a remote thing, just based on I didn't know if the Wi-Fi was working or not, but um, you can... Uh, You can download an application that'll leverage kind of VirtualBox to spin up a Kubernetes cluster on your laptop. It's called Minikube. Um, it's handled uh, as a first class citizen. It's basically the best way to get started on your local laptop. Um, so to install it, you know, it installs to uh, Windows, OS X, and Linux. Um, since I'm using OS X, uh, that's what I've used today. So the only other thing that you need is to install the Kube CTL which is the local client that you basically use to feed work to Kubernetes. Okay. Everyone see this? Yes. Yes. Okay. So yes. I have started up uh, Minikube here. I see that it's running. I have kubectl, which you have to install separately. Um, you can grab the binaries directly from the Kubernetes source. 
Uh, but I'm going to go through a basic example so that I can demonstrate pods and replica sets and everything. And this example is one that you can use yourself. It's under the Kubernetes repository, the main repository under the examples. It's called guestbook.go. Very simple application that you just insert names into and it records them in the end. Um, the basics of what is contained in here, I have my file here. This is actually built. It's definitely going to be bigger. <laughs> I'm creating a Docker file from uh, basically this set of files here. And I have all of these files in here. Um, you can combine all of these things into one giant file, um, but then when you're making changes to like your service versus your replica set, it's a little easier to reason about in uh, your chosen uh, SVN if you separate them out. Um, but note that you can combine uh, your spec for a replica set and your deployment and services in one file if you want. Um, I'll show this example because it did split them out and it's just a little easier to reason about. Um, so this uh, service uses uh, Redis and the front end is using uh, PHP, I believe. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to deploy the backend data store. I want the data to be there so that when I start the application, I can immediately start placing data into it. So I'm creating a replica controller. Like I said, replica controller, replica set, it's all the same thing. You can define these specs in JSON or YAML, um, just depending on your fancy. Um, and uh, a lot of the things when you're querying it um, get returned in a Go template family format, so you can also even if you submit it as YAML, it's going to get returned such that you can parse it with JQ or, or that Go template. So I'm creating, a, I'm using the API version v1. This corresponds to the actual v1 of the Kubernetes API itself. So v1 isn't just your metadata in here as far as what your application number is. I'm calling this the Redis master, and I'm giving it two labels. The app is Redis, and the role is a master, because Redis has both a uh, master and a uh, Kind of a worker component, I want to make sure that I differentiate between those, so I have two different controllers for those. I'm only giving it one replica right now because I only want one master. I place these selectors on here, as you can uh, see there, um, and that's so that later on when I create the service, I have something to be able to reference. Then we get into the containers part, which is <coughs> the pod part. I give that a name too, I say the image name, and uh, the colon uh, set of numbers there is your actual Docker version name. Um, if you're using Rocket, it's whatever's being pulled down by your container registry, basically. That's the version that's going to pull down. And you have to explicitly create those tags, which is out of scope of this presentation. Um, you can also name your ports here just for referencing them later on. And if you have a ton of ports that you're opening up for one application, it's easier to keep track of them. And, kind of assign a function to them. The container port that the REST server is, is listening on is 6379. So I've got many queues started. I'm going to use kubectl. Um, I can first see if anything's running by using kubectl get pods. Um, Minikube, for whatever reason, like injects this thing in the end. I think it's just in case you uh, are getting started and you didn't know that you launched things before. Um, but normally you won't see that in a live cluster, at least not in the versions I've been working with. So there's currently nothing running. So now we want to tell uh, Kubernetes to schedule some work. We're going to start with that master. So I say kubectl create. I can specify all this stuff on the command line if I want, um, but uh, you noticed uh, those files can get pretty complex and that's a lot to remember and type out every time. So. I use the kubectl create the dash f flag to reference a file. And now I say redis q master controller. So that'll start. And I can see by using kubectl get pods that I have one pod um, with uh, an, kind of an auto assigned name after that. If, you, if your pod isn't working based on um, a health check that you place for it, um, 
the way that Kubernetes uh, detects if something is alive or not is basically by you exposing a REST API or giving it a port that it can shoot a request at to see if there's a successful um, message that gets returned, either in the form of a 200 or um, uh, if you, use, you can use TCP requests uh, as such to also gauge whether these things are open. Um, and this basically is you exposing and saying, um, this is how I can tell if my application is up and functioning. Uh, if you have a more stateful set that maybe requires you to download some external dependencies before it starts up, you can have timeouts which allow you to skip over that check until it comes up, and then forevermore it will use that check to figure out what the status is of your machine. If you don't pass that at all, it's looking to see if the container exited. That is, the Docker service said you exited and or terminated, and that's how it knows that it's no longer running, and the scheduler is going to need to pick that up and reschedule it. So the next thing that I want to do is schedule boost. The master service. So if I have multiple masters, I want them to be exposed under one cluster IP. Um, because I'm only using one, it's not really that necessary to uh, create a service, but for the sake of completeness, I'm going to create a service out of this. Um, the same port that I'm going to be targeting is the one that I opened up over here in the controller. You can see that correlates to that. So in the end, I get a service, and I'll show you how you can figure out what it had the service once we create it. So I'm going to use groupctl create again. And now I can use a different get request to figure out what services I have running. You see the service master, the REDS master right here? The cluster IP, as I mentioned, this represents all of the services over here. So if I pointed at this IP from a dependent service, I would get load bounced around to an active pod that's listening. And that way I don't have to query for like all of them and then figure out myself which ones I want to connect to. Um, the external IP lines up with uh, things, like I said, if you created a service of type load balancer, um, that's going to show up for like what on my laptop can I connect to outside. Um, because in order to connect to that cluster IP and run curl request against it, I kind of have to be within the cluster itself because um, the cluster IP cannot receive like ICMP cyber traffic. So if you try to ping it, it's not going to work. It's only going to work when you start sending curl requests at it or other rest. Age and the random port of it, or the ports will be based on what you told us to open. And if you open up something called a node port, which I'll show in a different example, um, that'll also get show up under your ports here. So um, now that I have the masters, I need the actual Redis slaves. So I'm going to Redis master. Now I want two of these. So in replicas, I place two. I add the metadata that I want based on the labels. I open up the Redis uh, port. I'm using the Redis slave version, v2. So I go ahead and schedule that. This is also a, a controller. also have a spec for the service. It's not too different from the master, so I'll just go ahead and start that up too. So now when I do groupctl, get services, I can see that I have a Redis master, I have a Redis slave. I didn't get two of them, even though I have a specific uh, replica set of two. I'm just getting one cluster IP. check the pods, and I see that I have one master, and I have two Redis slaves. And those can be referenced independently with the services here. So now I'm going to deploy <coughs> the Redis service. This is the actual PHP application that actually uh, I will interact with in my browser. 
So let's call it sbook.controller here. And I want three of these. I'm referencing the container that I want right here. And I'm opening up port 3000 because that's what my application is running on. This does take a little bit longer than necessary, but I made sure to run through this example in case the network was being slow and I didn't want to have to pull down a ton of images. Um, so it's starting up pretty quickly. Normally it'll take a bit of time, but a lot of that time is just basically pulling down the Docker image. So if your Docker image is really big, it's going to take longer. So now I have three guest books. I have my master, I have the slave. Now I want to be able to use one endpoint to hit any of those active guest books. I don't want to just go to any one of them arbitrarily because what if they get rescheduled? So I'm going to create one last service. And this is going to be guest dot service. And because this is different than our other services, I'll show you what we're actually doing here. So we're saying that this service of guestbook uh, has the labels there at the top. We're selecting on the, the labels that we specified for replica sets before in the bottom there. So now everything that is a, an app name of guestbook is going to be included in the selector. And then at the bottom there, this is where I said services can represent different things. You can have a type load balancer or you can have something called a node port. What a node port does is it opens up this container on all of your nodes. So it doesn't matter if it is uh, scheduled on that node or not, the port will be opened and uh, exposed on all of the nodes. If you uh, fire a request at one of those nodes and it does not have that current application, it doesn't matter because the IP tables rules are properly set up that it'll proxy to a node that does have that application. Because Minikube is all just running locally, I don't have a ton of nodes, so this is kind of a new point, but Bears mentioning, but this is exactly how I do it. Um, load balancers are, are something, go ahead. How does it get proxied among the load nodes? Is there any load balancing that happens? Uh, the load balancing is, is kind of like, it's not like super deterministic because it, it kind of has a statistical value of like 80% of the time it's going to send it to these nodes, 20% of the time it'll send it to these. And that doesn't really change that often dynamically until you add more new nodes or they get scheduled somewhere else. So is this the same load balancer that is running uh, at a higher level that will implement business rules? Right, so then uh, <coughs> it would just basically know it's exactly where the pods are and it wouldn't have to open up that node port on all the machines. Okay. So the request will get bounced. <coughs> so there are some applications, of course, that you're going to have that are more latency sensitive. So you might have to be able to deal with it bouncing around everywhere. Right. In that case, you would need a type of load balancer. And if your cloud a, provider doesn't have one that integrates with Kubernetes, there is one under the contrib repo here. Um, I've never worked at Google before, but they're very stringent about labeling things as beta or alpha um, and, and so on. So if you look at a lot of the source, half of Kubernetes seems to be in beta or whatnot. But this is just based on how uh, stable they believe the API is. It has nothing really to do with it's missing a ton of functionality or anything. It's just the way that they do things. So here's a bare metal service load balancer that you can run yourself and deploy it through Kubernetes itself to act as a load balancer um, if you don't have one. It's based on a shader proxy, so you don't have to go through that manual effort I said like before where you have to go into your Nginx or HA proxy or hardware-based load balancer and update all these things because you know they're running over here now. This will take care of looking where everything is and auto-updating itself. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. So we have this deployed. We're going to take a look at our services. We have uh, the guestbook service represented by cluster IP here. I think I mistakenly said that the uh, the node port would be in there, um, but I didn't explicitly add it, and it's not going to show up in there. You kind of have to prod with it. So to get more information about 
uh, given type, whether it be a pod or a replica set or whatnot. Use the describe <coughs> command from poopctl. And this is going to spit out a bunch of information that it can about it. Spell it right. Yeah. It's a boring. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to describe this, this specific service, the guestbook service. Um, I didn't specify what I was actually looking for, I just said guestbook. So the specific thing I want to describe is the service of guestbook. So here I get back a little more information. I, it tells me that it's a node port. Um, it, it opened up, it has the targeted port there, and it's listing out these endpoints here. So if you notice, 172 is you know like a private IP. And this is where those CNI plugins come in. Um, one of the strengths of Kubernetes is it gives real routable IPs to Docker containers. And it sets all of this up with your given CNI plugin. So a Docker plugin on a completely different machine can resolve an IP of the Docker container on the other machine because of the sufficiently complex CNI integrations of um, your given plugin. In the plain Docker sense, you don't get that. You're not getting a physical IP. You're basically just opening it up on local host. You're saying it a little host, and, <laughs> and, uh, and it's uh, whatever your given port is, so it's local host. So you would need to know what that is. You can't just say, uh, ping any of these uh, IPs within my cluster and uh, route it that way. Is it like doing BGP advertisements for that stuff? Like what? Like Depending on your CNI plugin. <laughs> so uh, Calico, I know for sure, is using BGP to uh, update these things. Um, the differences between these CNI plugins is vast. Some of them are don't really uh, give you that much configuration, and they only expose the bare necessities. But some like Calico and Weave and others um, get sufficiently complex that they're on like if you're familiar with OpenStack Neutron type of terms. Okay, okay so um, in order to resolve this, if I'm outside of the cluster, I could go to this auto assigned. Uh, 30488. Um, but because I'm using Minikube, I'm going to cheat and it allows me to just say Minikube service guestbook and it's going to open this up in my browser. So here is my guestbook application. Uh, like I said, it's very simple. You're just going to put whatever you want in here and it's going to record that. And persist it because I'm using. Database that I did too fast and PHP. Mm -hmm. Other stuff in here. Um, and it's going to persist this, uh, because of that uh, back end. And if one of these uh, specific pods goes down, um, it doesn't matter because it's only going to route to the active pods. Now, there is a small delay in between updating IP tables rules, and then there is an occasion where you could hit something that doesn't exist. Um, in that scenario, uh, I can't accurately predict what happens. Um, uh, of course, using retries within your service is always a good thing, um, but it will update as soon as possible on the given nodes. Um, the update is very quick, um, but if you have a very uh, um, high performance application, there could be a case where you get stale problems. And that's just based on etcd being an eventually consistent uh, backend and uh, databases. So um, I opened up that, that up in my browser. If I was doing it manually, there's a few more steps that I would have to do. Um, use a tool called, uh, or a subset of kubectl called kubectl port proxy, which then you have to specify, I want my local host to listen on this, and then I open that up on the service that ends up on uh, the given machine that I want to select. That is that. Part of Wait, that. did you just say this has like an SSH like port forwarding built in? Yeah, there's a port forward in the kubectl plugin itself. That's right. And you can also, well, so unless you actually expose SSH in your Docker container, a simple SSH command isn't going to work. Right. Um, so so uh, depending on your container runtime, it uses something called NSenter to make this work. 
or it uses uh, some sufficient magic that I actually don't know. But yes, uh, if I wanted to get into this container and it was on another node, I can come over here to prove CTL. So I want to do the pull down base of the SSHing into this guest book. It sounded like you were mentioning like arbitrary port forwarding. Yes, you could do that too. That's like a port forward. Um, the reason why I showed this is because you said SSH. So that's <laughs> yeah, but like forwarding ports around. Like yeah, so that SSH, is like with the port forward command here. Forward one or more ports from your local host directly to that remote host. Um, does that answer what uh -huh. do you want? Okay, so I'll, I'll skip that part. <laughs> Okay, so, uh, demo. Um, so now, uh, you think this is really cool. You know, you want to get started, you want to graduate from Minikube, because just deploying things to your laptop is ineffective unless you put your laptop in the data center too. Um, Kubernetes <laughs> is one of those things where it's, it just has so many moving parts. It's very um, complex to operate if you're not used to these types of systems. Um, and almost every major cloud provider is now coming out with their own Kubernetes uh, implementation. I work for IBM, so I am pitching Bluemix.net. To create one, you can uh, do this for free. You just create a Bluemix account, and you'll get a free Kubernetes cluster uh, run for you for, I think it's 30 days. Um, what makes IBM Cloud uh, important? Uh, some of these serve, um, cloud providers, they're crippling Kubernetes slightly in some uh, way. So maybe they'll lock down certain APIs, um, based on some security precautions, or they will um, change some of the APIs in a fundamental way. Um, I've been cloud likes to boast that they um, support all of the native APIs. It's going to be fully managed when you pay for it. Um, and they also expose, like I said, some of these cloud providers don't have their own code uh, load balancer. <laughs> this one is written from scratch based on HA proxy and works directly with your IBM um, supported Kubernetes. A couple other features there, you can read through that if you'd like. So, uh, like I said, if you want to reach out to me, make sure you uh, put the underscore on there, unless you want the junket, Christopher Luciano. Uh, my GitHub is there, my email is there, and uh, it's just my phone name. So, I'm sure you have a lot of questions, so have at it. Is there an easy way to, so let's say I manually set up some services and some uh, pods, is there an easy way to export that into a JSON or anything like that? Yes. So. When you, uh, it, this is kind of building on that describe command. So I pass dash O output, and then I want it to be in YAML format. Oops. Uh, so. Have a man page entry, I think. Apparently, not an OS X then. <laughs> so, I'm not sure why it's not working because if you look here, it does say dash O is valid.
shouldn't fly, trust me. Um, <laughs> but I can't seem to find it. specify a good template right there on your manual. Yes. Okay, so that's one way to kind of filter on it. I'm trying to get back the whole thing that you may have submitted. And for the life of me, I can't remember what the command is. Trust me, it's there. Um, but practice what you rehearse, and then uh, you have to rehearse that. <laughs> um, other questions? Go ahead. What is the dev to uh, like hosting pipeline look like? If I'm getting something running on my laptop, what does it look like to go and then run in a you know, QA or integration or whatever environment, like, that's yeah, sure. on my laptop. So, um, kubectl uh, basically um, reads kind of from a config file that you have local on your laptop. I had out mine, but there's a password saved in and whatnot. Um, so you specify these types of environments, and I customized my CSH, CSH terminal to actually say what environment I'm pointed at right mm -hmm. here. So, mini queue I'm specified at here. To change to the configuration settings and whatnot for production, I would come in here to kubectl and say kubectl um, config. My autocomplete hasn't been working lately. Then I can set a context and specify kind of whatever I want. Um, so each different cluster will be locked down in a certain way, with potentially have different users and whatnot. So your file basically lists all of these things, or you can do it dynamically by passing it in, like you see here on the command line, mm -hmm. in order to point to different ones. Um, but once you have that spec working, um, and as generic as possible, um, you can just deploy it right up. Now, one thing that I didn't show is kind of, um, how do I keep kind of my configuration that's different between environments outside of my generic scheduler? And that's something that you use called a config map. I can show you an example here. So here I have different config maps um, that represent my different settings from environments. So I have one for this Armada environment, and I have another for a different environment. But all of those are contained in the config map. And these get mounted in as volumes to your plugin. Um, you have to specify where they want to mount, but they're going to mount in where you specify. So if you're using Nginx and you have a specific configuration for Nginx, you're going to mount that under the specified path for that replacing it with your specific file. So these are all objects that get stored within Kubernetes itself. Um, another thing that I should mention is that Kubernetes comes with a nice little dashboard, and you can get to it easily with MiniQ by saying MiniQ dashboard. Bump up the, everybody see that? So here, you have all of the different potential objects, including nodes. Uh, because MiniQ is just running one node, I'm only going to see one. But I can drill into these and get more information about what makes this node so special. Um, it's using Docker version this, you know, your Kube proxy version and whatnot. And then config maps are the um, come kind of in two flavors. You can have secrets, which will do its best, dependent on your permissions, to obscure what you actually put in the file. So, if you place a secret on the file and you said kubectl dash f with the type of secrets, and I, I mount that where I, this is what's contained in secrets, so I'm pointing out a file that's going to create the secrets. There's not a lot of sufficiently complex um, stuff that happens to obscure this, 
Um, it's basically based on a, permiss a permission basis, um, which you can read all about in the docs too. But I actually use a secret here for my MySQL password when I deployed the guestbook application. So I created the password.txt with uh, the most secure password ever in there. And I can see that from here because I have the proper permissions to do this. Um, now config map will look more like um, what your given config map will for the application that you're deploying normally. So because I'm deploying Prometheus here, if I look at Does the light background make it really difficult to read? Or can you see that? Okay. okay. So within here, uh, I create a kind of config map. I'm placing data in it. So this is the actual data that's going to be populated within um, where I mount Prometheus. Like I said, uh, Prometheus is something I would do talks on in the future, but just note that it's a type of metric scattering collection. So here I'm specifying it in exactly as I would if I SSH into a server that I deployed manually uh, with configuration management or, or something like that, and I catted out that file. So this looks exactly at what Prometheus would expect. Uh, and GenX would be different. So you create config maps based on your differences between environments, and this allows you to keep those services and controllers very generic. And that way, the only thing that's different is basically uh, the endpoints and whatnot that differ from environment to environment. Uh, you could generify this even more because um, you have that cluster IP to just represent um, DNS entries. Um, Kubernetes also integrates deeply with um, something that was created long ago called SkyDNS. I remember we were talking about it, like the first Docker meetup in Pittsburgh. They've since rebased it, uh, or rebased on top of it, created something called KubeDNS um, but because they didn't want to call it KubeDNS in the repo, which is called DNS. So you go to Kubernetes-DNS. But basically, this is just a fork of SkyDNS specifically suited for Kubernetes. And this will get launched in your cluster if you specify that you want it. Um, if you're using some of the um, tooling that's uh, provided by the Prometheus maintainers, namely Kube ADM, it's going to deploy it um, automatically because it considers it a critical service. It'll also, I think, deploy the dashboard automatically. And these things also run as pods within Kubernetes itself. Self-management type of concept. Yeah. Do you think of any multi-architecture clusters, such as having the master on uh, six, on Intel and kind of workers on ARM or anything like that? Yes. Yeah, so uh, there are official releases for ARM, uh, PowerPC, X390. I think that's what it's called. Uh, X86 and others. Uh, specifically, since I work for IBM, I have worked with the PowerPC version, and I can tell you that it works. Um, could you explain the difference between a daemon set and a service? Yeah, who's asking the question? Oh, same oh, one. Oh, sorry. It's kind of darker. Yeah. So uh, a daemon set is something that you run or want to run on um, all of your nodes. So say you have a logging collector, and you don't want to install it directly on the machine itself. Um, but you want it to run on all machines that are considered a Kubernetes node. You create a kind of daemon set, which I can actually show an example of that to you. See that? Yeah. So daemon sets are going to be deployed on each node. Now, if you brought in new clusters to your machine, you have the, the kubelet on them and everything, 
but you still kind of require the node exporter to be on that to gather metrics specific to that node. You don't want to have to manually do that every single time or add it to your install steps. You want to know that whenever I have a Kubernetes agent, uh, daemon sets are going to be scheduled across all of them. Um, so that means instead of just um, being dependent on the replica set that you deployed uh, and deploying as many as you specify for that, um, this will run on once on every single node. Not sure if I explained that correctly. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. So no, uh, the data sets you're normally going to use for a use case that you would normally like install a dev package for. I use the uh, logging because you can do something like Fluentd to actually um, enter into your containers. It's something that you're going to want because you want to gather logs on all machines temp um, that would be hosted in containers. Yeah. Um, so it's a cleaner way to kind of separate some of these um, things that you require outside of your traditional process of installing uh, with dev packages and configuration management. And Is a daemon set the only, can a service be exposed to the host network like a daemon set or is that unique to a daemon set? Oh, it, yeah, you saw a host network here? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, a service can uh, be exposed with a host network, but it essentially changes it a bit. I mean, node port is kind of the closest to a host network that you get. Normally when you're doing host network, um, you're not using some of the CNI um, resources, and you're just falling back to Docker default networking. It also sets up a few things called like hairpin mode and whatnot. Um, Is that similar to hairpin NAT? Huh? Is that similar to hairpin NAT, like on a routing level? Yeah, it's exactly that. Okay. Um, but that's also if you if you kind of fall back to some of the defaults. There's a default kind of CNI plugin called KubeNet. Um, which I don't really see deployed out in a while just because people usually want some of the more advanced features of other CMI plugins. Um, well, the last I checked, I couldn't, Flam was the only CNI available for ARM. And right. we're, we're mostly looking at Kubernetes on the ARM architecture on Pies and stuff. So um, exposing on the host network was for specific things like Node X. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I don't want to say the wrong thing and tell you that host network is a thing that could be embedded in services. Um, but I can tell you that it's not something that I normally do um, if I say that I want something to be in the host network. I normally do that in the replica set or, or actually the container itself and say that I explicitly want this port on the host open for this given container instead of exposing it for kind of all the containers dynamically. Because remember, a, a service is representing a selection of, of uh, replica sets. So if you did that on the service level, you'd be saying that you wanted it for all. But depending on your application, I mean, I guess in your case, use case, you do want it for all. But I, I can't remember if it actually is able to be done at the service level. Demon set is what we ended up settling on. So I just was interested in, it, in hearing yeah. the exact <laughs> from someone who uses Demon set is probably the, I mean, it's obviously working for you, but it's not like the correct <laughs> way to put it at. Um, I, I am pretty close to some of the containers of the other CNI plugins, so I can ask them about it if you want to send me an email. Okay. Uh, Arm is just one of those things that's like, if nobody actually asked for it, and maybe yeah. only one person asked for it, they're probably not going to have dedicated builds for it. Other questions? Yeah. What's the state of auto scaling? So auto scaling is another one of those things that was kind of in flux. Um, <coughs> and like I said, it's one of those problems that you are faced with every day um, when you're deploying these things without something like Kubernetes. So they they like to have auto scaling basically based on given metrics. So the only one that they actually expose right now, I believe, is memory metrics. So each of these kublets has something called C Advisor baked into them. And C Advisor is looking at all of the containers running on that node and collecting details about those given containers and bubbling them up under a metrics API for each kublet. Um, you deploy something called uh, kind of the horizontal upscaler, because that's the only one 
that they have that's working at the moment, and it's going to look at the overall um, specifications that you plugged in. So if you say that I want to create more replica sets dynamically based on a memory range that surpasses this, that's what the autoscaler is doing. And it's looking by default at uh, the metrics exposed um, by the C advisor, which runs on each individual node itself. But it is configurable, it will be configurable in the future. Um, the reason why I say it's in flux is because um, <coughs> Kubernetes really likes pluggability. So at every step, it tries to make things more and more generic so that you can plug in your own autoscaler if you want. So at the moment, it only is looking at memory, also because that was an easier case for it. But it does allow you to key off of custom metrics. So assuming that you export uh, through C Advisor or some other sort of fashion, um, custom metrics that you have for your given application, it is able to watch for those custom metrics too. Does that answer your question? Vertical op pod level scaling is also one of those things where they have an issue opened for it, um, but it has to be something that's handled um, well among each runtime. If they just don't want to implement it for Docker itself, and then people on Rocket or Kind of uh, screw over, but it is a thing. I haven't uh, experimented with it a ton, um, but I can tell you that there are quite a lot of Kubernetes customers that rely on it to auto scale. Um, because if uh, if they didn't, then they're they're falling back to seeing when their uh, is it working graph is getting close to its threshold and then having to do it themselves. Go ahead. What about a dynamic scaling that's not automatic? For instance, someone logs into an application front end and then a special container is created just for them to go be their sandbox and information is proxy between them and that container. And so when they're done with that, that container is spun back down. Mm. Is that the use case that Kubernetes supports? Um, so there is logic that you can add the the horizontal pod scaler is also based on labels. So it's only going to horizontally auto scale um, those that fall under the label that it's watching. Um, so you, you have to deploy one for each individual application that you want to horizontal auto scale. It's not like a all or nothing buy-in. Okay. In the case that you're mentioning where it comes up with a different name, if it is part of that selector, it probably would get counted in the auto scaling. So you'd have to tweak a bit of your auto scaling rules to make sure that if it comes up, it's not going to have that label, because if it has that label, the metric for the autoscaler is going to think this should be part of the metrics I should key off of. So you, but there is a facility for an application to request a new container to be created, and then it can speak to it, or something like that? Yeah, that's up to Scale kind of thing. how you uh, set up whatever client is interacting with the Kubernetes cluster itself. Okay. Um, I imagine at that point you would create maybe a custom replica set that would be basically the same as the normal one, but you're maybe adding on specific labels for like customer X that is different from the public pool. Cool. Um, we're, we're a little over, so um, I'll, I'll stick around for a bit to answer any other questions uh, that you have. Um, but yeah. Um, Come talk to me if you have any more questions. If you have specific requirements for looking to get into Kubernetes or whatnot, it'd be great to hear about them. Thanks.